a little bit of what I'm talking about today, that's what I want you to understand. You know, I, I know we're talking about, you know, as one said, some of you may have get this, get that. It's not about, we need to get our eyes on, on, on eternal things. That's right. And I want to encourage you today a little bit to talk about eternal things. Before I get there, like I said, we've been on an adventure to discover some mind-blowing things about God. So again, I, again, I ho ho hope you've been looking at some things a little differently as we go through these messages, just looking at things in different ways. But again, what does the Bible say about the awesomeness of God, about the mind-blowingness of God? In Isaiah chapter 40, as we use this every single week with this, verses 25 through 26, God himself is asking a question. It says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. God is asking that. He says, Lift up, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name because of his great power and incomparable strength. Not a single one is missing. So here... The, the Bible is being described God as being what? Truly an awesome, mind-blowing God. And I hope through this, you, you begin to look at some things, maybe, because again, maybe you're in a church while you sort of just sort of read over things without really thinking about the awesomeness of it. Like when we started this, we talked about God's awesomeness and mind-blowing power displayed in what? Creation. And how when God just said, let this be done, let so-and-so, and all of a sudden, that's what happened. I mean, just, just think, just really think about, about the power of being able to do that. Just to say something, and there it's done. Who would like to have? Who would sort of like to be? You know, have the power like a genie without or a witch? I'm not saying you, but you know, everything we see on TV, it's like they always bring something out of nowhere. But I will tell you, no, no, I'm going to go. But just be able to say it, boom, it happens. But truly, from a human standpoint, this is mind blowing. And then three weeks ago, we looked at God's mind blowing way in which He delivered Israel and made them into a nation through the ten plagues and the crossing. Of the Red Sea. I mean, just really think about it. Because I shared even a little bit more about that last week about that, how why the crossing of the Red Sea would have to be, and they would have to go across as like 5,000 people wide even cross there to do it in the night. When you're talking about two and a half million people, besides animals and everything else. It's a mind blowing thing. But then two weeks ago, we looked at God's most mind blowing act through his mind blowing love by him giving his only son for us. And he did that while we were still enemies of his. Like I said, then last week we looked at how God is, through his mind-blowing way, which he can provide for his people. We looked again, we looked at how he brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea, and then how he sustained them for 40 years. We looked at the numbers. We looked at how much food it would take to sustain them every day. How much water it would take to sustain them every day for 40 years. And honestly, the mind-boggling, remember we talked about the amount of food would be a train a mile long every day. That amount of food would have to be there every day for 40 years. The amount of water would be a train three miles long. Every day for 40 years. And that's not it. All of it. We talked about it, how just, we sometimes we forget how large they were. Remember I shared with you how they estimated that the size of the group they were it would have took 750 square miles just to house them. Wow. And God sustained them. Every day they got up, there was manna out there to eat, and there was water. And, and, and then he would throw in quail. He would throw in other meats. He did this for 40 years. God is a God that can provide no matter the situation. Certainly. And remember, he did all of this. Why, where were they when he did all of this? Anybody remember? Where were they? The desert. Wow. Wow. He did this for 40 years for two and a half million people. Wow. Wow. But that's not all to, that, that's not all there is to God. In fact, one of the mind-blowing things I want to talk to you about today is God's mind-blowing future He has for His children. We need to stop looking at the temple. We need to stop looking at the temple. We need to stop looking at just the earth. We truly get our minds focused on what God has for us. That's why when we begin to realize that this world is not our home, this world, as the psalm says, this world is not my home, I'm only passing through. You know, Abraham himself, he wasn't, he wasn't really looking for an earthly kingdom. He was looking for a kingdom a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Just briefly, we've been dealing with this over the last little while in our Bible study on Tuesday nights talking about revealing the mysteries of heaven. 
I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit something about the state. As you know, and if you, you you've been around me for a while, you know I'm a numbers guy. I like looking at numbers. I like looking at things and say, wow, that that's pretty cool. When you begin to truly look at it and break it down and look at it, especially since we're dealing with the mind blowingness of God, when you look at the numbers, they're astounding. They're all inspiring. They are awesome. When you begin to look at the numbers. But as we start today, as a scripture to open the message today, I'm going to open this portion of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Here's what we read. That is what the scripture means when, it, when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. In other words, we begin to think we know, we begin to think we understand, but the Bible here is saying that no, I have seen, no ears, or no mind has understood what God has prepared. We may, we may see something, we may hear something, we may read something in the Bible, and we may be picturing it in our mind, but I'm here to tell you, when you finally see it with your own eyes, when that day comes, you're going to say, as the Queen of Sheba did when she became the Solomon's kingdom, says, the half of what I imagined what was told me wasn't even told. It's more more than I ever thought, but it's even going to be more so than that. Literally, when we when we go to heaven, if it can truly be jet.com, our heads will go. It is literally going to blow our socks off. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. <coughs> but but as, as we did last week, we're talking about God being a provider, right? And I'm talking about how he, how, what He's offering us in the future. So let's let's initially look at what He gives us right now. And what He gives us right now is this thing called Earth that we live upon. I mean, who here doesn't live on Earth? If you're if you're in this place this morning, <laughs> Earth is your habitation. Earth is your home right now. This isn't my eternal home. This is my temporary home. But right now, I live on this planet. So let me just share a little bit with you about this planet. See if you can bring up that next slide for me. There's a reason why I'm going here, okay? So, so you, under, you may probably already know where I'm going to go with this, all right? The total surface area of Earth is roughly 196,900,000 square miles. So if you figure up all the surface counting, the water, the land, and everything, there's almost 200 million square miles of surface area on the Earth, okay? The total land surface of the Earth is about 57 million, a little over 57 million miles. I have the numbers up there. I'm not going to get all the numbers here as far as being exact. Of which 33% of those square miles is desert. 20, and about 24% is mountainous. So subtracting the uninhabited 57%, which is roughly 32.5 million miles, from the total land leaves about 24, a little over 24 million miles for everyone to live in. That's the inhabitable land. After you remove the deserts, because I mean, the deserts aren't really favorable to human life, you can live out there for a little while, but as far as, but again, it, it's not really inhabitable. And how many knows? No one lives on the top of Mount Everest. Many of these mountaintops that are ice covered or snow covered. People don't usually live up there all year round. They might live somewhere close to it, things like that, but they don't. That's what, so, so they came down with what to consider habitable land, let alone we have a continent down on the southern hemisphere of our planet, which is, they have some people living there, but it's probably about 100 or 200. They're in, a, they're in a research facility, that's about it. They're really not living there. It's just a temporary stay. But we have a whole continent that's completely uninhabitable. Okay? But, it, but, you know, we have about 24, 24, 24 and a half million square miles of inhabitable land space, which is about lower, almost 16 billion acres of inhabitable land. So if every person alive on the earth right now, right now, was to be given their, their equal share of land, it would equal, but everybody would get on the earth would get about two acres. The land. Okay? So, this is, this is the ball that God has placed us on, and He's fixed this thing up to the first. And there's a reason why I'm showing, sharing you all this, because we all know, we know how big the earth is for us. 
Again, it's, yes, we know it's small compared to other things in the solar system. It's definitely small compared to the things in our galaxy. And it's definitely small in comparison to the universe. But this is where we live. And this is what God has prepared. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to compare it now to what, this is what God has prepared, what we're on now. But I want to compare it to what he has in store for us, okay? Now, here's what we're going to read. Revelation chapter 21, <laughs> verses 10 through 17. Here's what we read. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like Jasper's clearest crystal. The city wall was broad, was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels. And the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones. And on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me held in his hand a golden measuring stick to measure the city and its gates and its walls. Then he measured it. I'm oh, sorry, oh, sorry. And when he measured it, he found that it was square. It was as wide as it was long. In fact, its length, width, and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick according to the human standard used by the angel. So he begins to give us the dimensions of the city, the, the city of God, the God's preparing. And I know in times past, I brought these numbers out to you, but I want to bring them out to you again today. Remember, I shared the numbers with you about the earth, right? I shared the numbers with you that the, the earth in, in total surface area is roughly 200 square miles, okay? Now, just, just, just 200, no, sorry, 200 million square miles. Now, just with me for a second, as we know, the New Jerusalem is 1,400 by 1,400 by 1,400, okay? So just for argument's sake, let's just knock it down to where they're each one a mile high, and we, so we have 1,500, we have 1,500 levels of, well, 1,400 levels, I'm, some of the numbers are 1,500, 1,400, only 1,400 this time. So we have 1,400 levels of 1,400 by 1,400. If we were to spread them out as being a mile high 1,400 times, hold that next one for me. Oh, wait, oh, go ahead and hit it hit again. This would be, first of all, this would be New Jerusalem in comparison to the United States. Just from one, if you're just looking at just from just square footage this way. Just from the 1400 by 1400. That's how big New Jerusalem would be. Now imagine taking 1,399 more of these and just start spacing them out all over the earth. Okay? The earth is 200 million square miles. If we were to do this with the New Jerusalem, just take it a one mile high and do that. This would be the number. I think I have one. Let's see. 2.7 billion square miles. If you were to take each one and just knock it down to one level, so you did 1,400 levels all the way around, at 1,400 by 1,400, it would be over 10 times the amount of square footage, of square miles, than what the Earth is now. And then, if we broke it down, since I told you about the square, I told you if everybody living now was given land um, for inhabitable, you know, for that, from the acreage, you would get like two acres. The amount of acreage would be in the trillions. 1.7 trillion square acres that way. And each person living now would receive 234 square acres. Instead of two square acres, you would receive over 100 times the amount. And in fact, it's estimated that 107 billion people have lived since the earth has been in existence. I wanted to look that up. And if you were to look at it that way, they would have 16 square miles, I mean 16 square acres each, which, anybody know what, what an acre is? It's 210 feet by 210 feet. So imagine 234 of them for people are alive now. That's for everybody on the planet. That's for seven, that's for seven and a half billion people. 
But yet, if we took it to, to, to everybody who's ever lived, everybody who's ever lived be able to have 16 acres each, 16 square acres. Wow. That's, that's a lot. But yet, if you were to take New Jerusalem and break it down, that's how, that's how big it would be. But that's it. Okay, well, you can say, well, your pastor, maybe that, that's not the thing. Well, and I looked it up and I said, well, how tall, would, how big is the earth atmosphere? How far is it from land to where you consider it being outer space? Anybody know how, what that distance is? From land to outer space. 62 miles. When you, when you leave the surface of the earth to truly be what's considered to be outer space, to leave the atmosphere of the earth, it's 62 miles up. So I said, okay, well, let me do this. Let me divide 62 into that. And when I did, we went from having 1,400 levels. Oh, if we want to keep this thing about New Jerusalem spaced out like it would be earth, right? It went from being 1,400 levels to be, I think the number was, I think it was 23. 23 levels. But yet, when you multiply 23 levels by what was left over the square footage, it's still equal to be 44 million square miles, which is still 20 million more square miles than you have old land we have right now. This is what God's preparing to just the city. I don't know exactly how New Jersey will be set up. I don't know if we're going to be in, in layers. I mean, I don't know if we're all going to be sort of like in, like, like inside the board where we're just living on the outside of the, the center that's 1,400 miles. I, I don't know. All I know is I'm just trying to put the numbers out to you of how big this thing is, okay? And trying to break it down for you to really look at this. And this is something that, that God uh, is preparing for us. But, but, but not only is he preparing New Jerusalem for us, but listen to what he tells us about the rest of the earth. Okay? So when New Jersey comes down, he's not getting rid of the earth. The earth will still be in existence, but he's going to do something to the earth. Listen to what it is. In Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, we read this. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So all of a sudden, what? Forget something new. The old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every time. Well, first off, he's promising what? That he's going to be with us now. Amen. We're going to, you know, no longer are we just going to have to get down on our knees and, 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 and believe that he hears our prayer. We're going to be able to see him face to face. We're going to be able to carry on a conversation with him face to face. I mean, well, imagine, you might imagine just talking to God face to face. Look, him sitting there saying, Yvonne, how was your day? What'd you do? And you go, oh, what'd you, go? What'd you do? He's, well, you know, I sort of, I'm keeping the universe intact and, you know, <laughs> and all this stuff. And let alone, you know, this, this, and that. But, but just think about it, just truly be able to just talk to him face to face. That, that's literally, because it says here that he's going to be with his people. God himself will be there. He'll be with them. His home is now among his people. But listen to what it also says. He says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone for how long? Forever. Forever. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. What's he making new? Everything. I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Other words, you're saying what? It's going to happen. This is the way it's going to be. The same as when in creation, when he said, let there be light, and there was. When he said, let there be this and that, and there was. The same as he's saying here, what I'm telling you is trustworthy and true. So guess what? What he's saying here, it is going to happen. But it doesn't stop there. In chapter 22 of Revelation, verses 1 through 6, we read it says, And then the angel showed me a river with the water, with the water of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and, and of the Lamb. And it flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with fresh crop each month. 
and the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. See, that's the part I like about this here. What did you say? No longer will there be a curse upon anything, which means we will no longer live in an imperfect world where, where hurricanes come in and wreak havoc, where tornadoes come down and do this, where children are born with deformities, where marriages are broken up, where homes are destroyed, where murders happen, where people get addicted to drugs. All of this will be gone because there will no longer be a curse. Oh, wow. See, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm anticipating that home. I'm anticipating that time when God allows us to happen and He remakes this world the way He initially intended it to be and makes it perfect once again. See, this is what He's preparing for us. I'm telling you, when you begin to think about this stuff, it should literally blow your mind. There will no longer be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him, and they shall see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. Hey, when that day comes, people are going to know we're Christians. We can't be no under undercover ones at that time. Bottom line, he says His name will be written on our forehead. Talk about somehow, some way, it's going to be across our heads. And there will be no night there. So some of you might get upset. Guess what? You're not going to sleep in heaven. Not gonna sleep in the New Jerusalem. You won't need it either. There will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord will shine on them, and they and they will reign forever and ever. And the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. And the Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. And I just have written down here. I said, Can you just say wow? Wow. God has an awesome future awaiting us. And again, I don't know about you, but I can't wait. I cannot wait to see it come to pass. I have a couple of verses, more verses I want to read here to you. And again, I'm talking about this awesome future that God has for us. I want to close out with this, these next two portions of Scripture. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 6 through 8, I sort of stopped at that earlier because I wanted to say it towards the end of the message. But here's what we read in verses 6 through 8. It says, and he, and he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Listen to what he says. The cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The thing is, I don't want to be part of the second death. I want to be part of the resurrection. Amen. 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 Because it's those, those who are part of the resurrection are those who are going to get to see and be part of this heavenly city that we're talking about, this heavenly kingdom, how God's going to come in and remake this world. We're going to be ones who are a part of that. And I have your all what a mind-blowing promise from God. But then the last portion of Scripture I want to read is the last verses in the Bible. And here's what it says. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Amen. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the, the, the murderers, the idol worshippers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the, for the churches. I am both the, the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy written within this book, 
If anyone adds anything to what is written written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if you, you want to find out what that is, start to read Revelation. You, you don't want this stuff, okay? If anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. He who is faith, who, he who is the faithful witness to all these things say, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's why I said, all right, we can say this. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. Somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckoned me from heaven's golden door. And I can't be back home in this world. And my mind's going blank, but this world is not our home. And as I begin to think about it, as I begin to think about it, song, oh, what glory waits me in heaven's bright city. They talk about how Jesus will outshine them all. Even though we, we all the stuff about the city that God has prepared and how God's going to make this world new. The greatest thing about all of it isn't going to be the city of gold. Because if you begin to read about New Jerusalem, it's it's gold that, that is so pure that it's transparent. Wow. I mean, I'm, have anyone ever seen transparent gold? No. But God said it's going to be so pure. It's gold that's so pure you can see through it. Holy cow. I mean, I mean, really, just, just let that sink in for a second. But yet, that's not going to be what makes New Jerusalem of any value. It's going to be about God himself, the Father, and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, being there. That's why that songwriter can write that Jesus will outshine them all. It's all. It, it has been, it is, and it always will be about Jesus. And because of Jesus, this is what God the Father is preparing for us. This is what's going on. This is what he's making ready for us right now. All we have to do is buckle our seatbelts up, hold on, grab on to him, and keep on understanding that he is the Almighty God and go out and go out in, in his name as much as we can and declare the love of Jesus Christ to everybody we come in contact with. Because, hey, we have nothing to lose. Because if this is what he has in store for us, what are you worried about? Let's be real. What are we worried about? See, too many times, as, as David Jeremiah says, we're going through the study, in the churches, sometimes we don't talk about what God had in store for us as much as we should. But we truly keep in mind, again, we, we can't be so heavenly minded we're no looking good. But we need to keep the prize in front of our eyes. Right. So we can realize that, that when the enemy comes in your body, all of a sudden, Maybe he gives you a diagnosis of some sickness that the doctor can't be cured. You say, you know what? That's all right. Because my home is not here. That just means I get to meet my Lord a little bit sooner. But until that day, I'm going to work for him. I'm going to take on the attitude of Job. The Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. And though he may slay me, yet still I will praise him. Oh, man. See, see, there's an attitude you get to. And when we do that, we realize that there's not this world. Come on, devil. You know, I tell you before, you, let's grab the old Pat Benatar song. Come on, hit me with your best shot. Come on, devil, hit me. Because the thing is, I know greater is he. I know greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world. And because what he has prepared, what he's prepared for me, what he's declared that's going to be there for me, take your best shot. Take your best shot. Because you may take me out down here, but I'm going to be with him forever. And so all I'm going to have a last night. But if God says, see, think, guess what, devil? I'm going to kick your butt while I'm down here, too. That's right. Amen. Because my God is greater. My God is stronger. Yes, is. Oh, man. I'm, I'm just trying to just begin to think about what he has in store. I'm saying, God is a mind blowing God. God. Amen. Yeah. Yes. And I just want to end this our time today thinking about this. Just thinking about how awesome he is. Sometimes we just take a stand. Come up and get ready. We're, we're going to declare how great. Great are you, Lord. Great are you. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. Great are you, Lord. And to go go back to how we even started all these messages, we have breath in our lungs because of life. He's the one yes. who's given to us. Yes, amen. And this morning, like I said, if you, I consider this today to be more of a day of praise. We're looking at anticipation of what God has in store. 
Let's praise him in spite of we don't know what's going to happen yet with the Lamb. But you know what? No matter what happens, he's worthy of praise. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. So can we just truly end this day and say, Lord, we praise you. Absolutely. No matter what the next week and a half may hold. Amen. No matter what the doctor says. Amen. No matter what my employer says. Amen. You're great, Lord. You're in control. And I'm going to praise you in spite of the storm. We need to praise him before it comes. Yes. We need to praise him if and when it shows up because this storm may not come, but I'm telling you, so we're in the future because we live, because we live in an imperfect world, because there's a curse upon this world because of sin, guess what? A hurricane's going to land again in the United States somewhere in the future. Let's Even if the rapture takes place, they're in tribulation, I'm sure, so this is going to happen. An earthquake's going to happen. A tornado's going to happen. A disaster is going to happen because the curse is still here. One day, one day, one day, God declares there will be no curse. Amen. Oh, man. So let's get our praise on now. Can we do that? Let's get our praise on now. We stand with us. Let's just worship it. If you want to come up front, you can do that. If you want to stay where you are, that's fine too. Let's sing our hearts out. Let me do that. So you say, You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart. Say, you can fly.